Hey everybody, welcome back to video number four. This is gonna be a fun one because today we are going to be kind of closing out the whole series on basic electronics. Uh, there's gonna be plenty more videos to come that dive down into some of the specifics of all the content that we've talked about so far, but we've already covered now with four videos, the power supplies, the conductors, and the load devices, and today is that final one called the control devices. Now these four basic parts of every circuit are pretty much just we take any one of those and say, now let's just get more complicated with the load or get more complicated with the controls or we start to look at a, a specific kind of power supply and we can dig up all kinds of great content, but we can't really stray away from these four basic pieces. So today what we're gonna be focusing on is the control devices. Now it's, it's kind of arguably the most important part, although we probably could say that there's two of the two of the four pieces so far that have been the most important to ensuring that electronics and electricity can work, and it is the load device and the control device. Now, certainly the load devices are absolutely the most critical uh, because that's what gets stuff done. I mean, if you don't have the motor, what's the whole point of the circuit in the first place? So that one probably does hold the priority as being the most important part of the circuit. However, if we don't have some sort of a way to control that, like an on-off switch for the motor, it also loses a lot of value too. So although the, the load devices are the most important, this control device subject is, is absolutely the second most important part of the entire circuitry equation. So we'll start again, just like we always have with the most basic rudimentary control devices, and then move on from there and talk at least, at least a, a, a little bit of an example of some of the more complicated ones. Um, but then after this, like I said, we'll be able to dive into the specific emphasis of different types of these control devices. So what does control mean? Um, and I guess control really could be summed up in saying, how do we make the electricity behave the way we want? The load device is responsible for the conversion of energy, making something useful happen because of the energy. But the control devices are the ones that make the energy behave the way that we want it to. Now, sometimes that's as basic as, should there be electricity, yes or no? That's a pretty simple control device, but certainly we want it to behave. Like um, lights in your house, they, they're expensive to run lights. It's expensive to run heaters. Also, it'd be really uncomfortable if all of your heaters ran in the summer. So we obviously need some sort of a way to turn that on and off or to get the circuit to behave the way that we want exactly when we want it to happen. And sometimes it gets more complicated than that. Like what if we want uh, a fan to run at a particular speed? Okay, now we've got to vary that control a little bit more than just on off and give it some sort of more advanced behavior. Uh, and after that, there is no end to the types of controls that we can use. Um, so again, we'll start with the basic ones. And probably the easiest way to see control on a day-to-day -day basis is the light switch. The light switch in your house is that on-off kind of control. Even a three-way switch, the ones where you might have two or sometimes three different switches that control the same light, they can still be considered on-off switches because that's the behavior of the light. On-off, or sometimes what we call true-false kind of control, that type of control just has a response of either 100% on or 0% on. There is no in-between. So the light switch is a good example because no matter whether it has the little words on and off, a single way switch printed on it and we toggle it on and off or the three or four way switch, they still have the same response and that's power reaching the load device or no power reaching the load device. Now power means current flowing in the circuit. If we have a voltage source, like you do at your electrical panel, but we have no channel for the current to run through, then there is going to be no energy dissipated by the load device. So the switch's responsibility is to allow current to flow through the circuit, and if it's one of these on-off kind of devices, then it means either the full amount of current consumed by the load device is allowed to flow, or no current at all can flow which means that we have to use the right kind of control devices. For example, let's say that we're trying to run a, um, a huge motor. A huge motor, that's a lot of energy to drive. It's gonna consume a lot of current. We could probably assume that. A lot and a little when you talk about electricity is all a relative number. What is a lot of power? What is a little bit? But if we're running a big motor, we could probably say, yeah, I, that's probably a lot of current. Now, if we choose to run a tiny, tiny little switch, like a tiny little push button, like the kind of thing like a, like a reset button inside your Wi-Fi router or something like that, 
technically, that's a kind of switch that electricity can either flow or not. It's an on-off kind of device. The idea, the concept is the same, but that device is so small that the amount of electricity being shoved through it to be used by that load device is probably going to melt that device. So if, unless you want to end up with a little liquid puddle of plastic and metal by sending so much current through it, or it just begins smoking, if you don't want that, we need to choose the right kind of a control device for the application. So when we look at a control device, for example, here, it's not a light switch, but it is an industrial push button. Same kind of thing. We allow electricity to flow if we push the button, release the button, no electricity flows. Now, if I look at the contact on the side of it, I see printing on it. Now, see printing that goes both voltage and current. Now, voltage and current are both very important when we're talking about even the most basic control devices. First, the voltage is an important number because if we exceed the voltage rating of a switch or uh, even a circuit breaker, you know, you go to your panel and you can turn off an entire bank of circuits by flipping the little switch on the circuit breaker. Great protection device. But if you look at them, each one of them has a voltage rating on it. But the important number that we talk about, I mean, you never, you never say, oh, uh, there's, a, there's a 20 volt circuit breaker or a 15 volt circuit breaker. You never say that number, you say amp. But the voltage is still a very important number because voltage, higher voltages, can cause arcing or sparks inside of a switch. So if we choose the wrong voltage, then as soon as voltage gets applied to it, when the switch is open, which means nothing is flowing, then that means there's a ton of voltage on one side, no voltage on the other. And if I can build a spark across that instantly, I, could, I might even weld the two pieces of metal together if it's a big enough spark, and then tons of electricity is gonna flow and I can't turn it off anymore because it's, it's melted itself together. Those sparks can be extremely dangerous. So instead, we need to make sure that when we install a device, a control device, we look at the voltage rating, and if it says 240 volts, do not exceed 240 volts, because then a spark can occur, and it can be very dangerous. Now this one here, this, this industrial push button, it says 10 amps at 24 volts, but 2.5 amps at 400 volts. Well, that's interesting that they've given us two different voltages there in this switch to deal with. You'd think if it's safe at 400 volts, why would you give us a rating at 24? That's way less voltage. I can't get a spark to happen there. The problem is, as you begin closing it, there will reach a point in every switch, I don't care how small or big it is or what voltage supply we're using, there will come a point while it's being closed that a spark is gonna happen. If it's a low voltage, the switch will be almost closed, and as it's almost, those contact points are touching, little spark jumps across. If we have so much current jumping across that spark, even if the spark is tiny, a huge amount of current can cause a big release in energy, and that can damage the switch and the people around it. On the other hand, if we have a huge voltage, then that, like, 400 volts, that's massive. In fact, I probably really wouldn't want to use a, an industrial push button where I'm pushing on it somewhere right next to 400 volts, but it's rated up to that. But if I have 400 volts, I would expect the spark to be much bigger because more energy potential means it's going to jump across an air gap much sooner. So I better not allow as much current through that gap as for a smaller voltage. So I would always expect on a switch rating to see a lower voltage allow a higher current a higher voltage to allow a lower current because it's really an amount of potential energy that can cause damage to the circuit and the operator if at any point in that switch you close it and a spark happens. Believe it or not, that happens in your light switch too. You just can't see it because it's covered in plastic. But every switch that physically moves, there will come a point where the contacts get close enough together that a little spark occurs right before they make contact. The bigger the voltage, the further apart they can make a big spark. So we do not want to allow as much voltage at that point. So every switch will have a rating for the amount of voltage that we're safely able to apply across it and an amount of current that's able to flow through that switch as we're applying that voltage to it. So we have to be careful that whenever we, apply, whenever we plug a switch or a push button or anything like that, an on-off kind of control that physically moves into a circuit, 
that we're very aware of its voltage and current ratings to keep our situation safe. Now I do have here an example of a circuit breaker. Now this is gonna be a quite a different circuit breaker than what you have at your house. Usually those are made to just snap right across a set of bus strips, which are these big metal strips running up and down in the panel. Those breakers will be able to fit across either one of them to make contact with power or across two of them to make contact with power in the case of needing to run a big 240 volt device. And you'll notice those ones because they have a big double, um, kind of like this, where there's two terminals, two different circuits with the, uh, they'll call them ganged together. So they'll have a strip across them that makes two switches operate at the same time. That's allowing two different bus voltages to supply your load, which is two opposing voltages, 240 volts. If it's only a single breaker, then we're only using 120 volts. But somewhere on printed, right on the front of that breaker, just like it is here, we see a current, not a voltage. So I just got done saying the voltage is an important number, which it certainly is. But the current is also a very important number because that's what, con uh, that's what protects our devices that we have connected to it. Now this one here, it says 220 VAC, tiny little numbers on the side, 220 VAC. Okay, so note to self, do not exceed 220 volts because it has told me that if you exceed 220 volts, you can get a spark inside, dangerous. But the big number that I see right above it and the number that I see up printed right on the top is one amp. So that means that in a circuit breaker, the amperage of the circuit breaker is really the most important number, or the one that we have to think about most commonly. It tells us how much can I use from this circuit before I trip the breaker. Now breakers tripping is a really good thing. Uh, some people kind of look at oh, a breaker tripped as if it was a bad thing, but that tells you that there is something in that circuit that's using too much power. Now if you have an older house like I do, sometimes just having a heater running way over on one side of the house and then you plug your vacuum in on another side of the house and all of a sudden a breaker trips. Well, believe it or not, that's a good thing, as annoying as it can be, because if you didn't have that breaker, then you might be using too much current and too much current going through a circuit with certain size wires generates heat. So, annoying circuit breaker tripping or burning your house down? Well, I guess when you think about it that way, the breaker isn't really annoying after all. It just tells you, hey, by the way, don't exceed these kind of numbers. Don't plug too much stuff into one circuit or you can cause problems. That's really good information to know. So alternative to that is we could completely rewire the house and use bigger wires and replace every breaker with a bigger breaker and then it's not as likely to trip. So I guess you could do that, but that sounds like a really time consuming, expensive task. Instead, you simply say, I should be aware not to use the heater and the vacuum at the same time. So go turn the heater off and then use the vacuum. Much simpler solution, while still the breakers kind of keep us from getting too carried away with just, oh, just plug in more stuff and everything should work fine. If you have failures inside the wall, let's say for example, uh, you have a little metal conduit box and you improperly installed the wires and they're, they're making a bend and so the insulation rubs on the metal box. Now probably after a while, that insulation is gonna to begin to wear out. And what happens if the insulation wears out and all of a sudden electricity flows through that metal box right around to the other wire? Well, there would be a ton of electricity flowing through that little, they call it a short circuit, when electricity is allowed to flow. And if there's a short circuit, lots of current is gonna flow. You want your control device, this breaker, to automatically trip off if there's too much current in the circuit. So the breaker is a really important part of the circuit, and it is a control device, but more of an automatic control device. I wouldn't go so far as to call it a sensor, but it's sensing the amount of current through some action, and usually it's either magnetic, so enough electricity flows through a coil and generates a magnetic field and opens contacts, or thermal, too much heat, like a thermostat will cause them to open, and sometimes both, depending on the construction but it's a controlled device that really senses current. We could call it a most basic form of a sensor. Thermostat is kind of the same way. It's a sensor, just a really basic one. Now, a push button has the same action, opening and closing, but it's not a sensor because it doesn't automatically sense the environment around it. Somebody manually has to go in and if it's a switch, rotate it, flip it up and down, push the button, something like that. So it's a, still a control device. Here's another example of a push button. So this one, 
You can hear it being pressed slightly. Here's one that has a much louder click to it. We can feel that spring action when all of a sudden it goes from being disengaged to completely engaged with one snap. So it's a very fast action. Other ones that can go much slower. Have you ever tried to turn a light switch on and off? You know, kind of hold it halfway in between and get to the point where the light's halfway on. You can't do it. It switches from on to com off to completely on very quickly. Now, when we talk about the circuit here, the whole scope of it, we have voltage coming in from your panel. We have a control device, which is the breaker. Then we have all of the conductors, which are the wires in your wall, including the outlets, which we talked about in conductors. Those are part of the conductive path of the circuit. And then we have whatever's plugged in. Now, usually that thing that's plugged in also has a switch, like a lamp. It's always going to have some sort of a little switch in the cord or switch somewhere up there. But sometimes there are things that do not have an on-off switch. I have a little grill, a little George Foreman grill at home. As soon as you plug it in, there's no on-off switch anywhere. It's, it's on. A lot of the little waffle irons are the same thing. You turn it on, you plug it in, it's on. So we have to ensure that if you plug something in and it uses just a little too much electricity, there better be a control device somewhere in that circuit. Usually we don't have switches to turn outlets on and off, sometimes. But usually those are kind of specialty outlets that we allow to switch on and off. We, we had to design them that way. Usually outlets just go straight back to the panel and it's the breaker that's the only control device protecting us from using too much current and starting electrical fires. So don't ignore the breakers and fuses are the same thing. Don't ignore fuses because those are our only form of protection when some failure happens in the circuit or we try to overload it. Now sometimes, and maybe this is taking more of a, an industrial approach, sometimes the control devices are actually other other devices that are driven by other things in the circuit. Uh, the relay, just like we talked about in load devices, the relay was a load device. Well, the relay is also a control device. In fact, they call it relay. When you think about a relay race, uh, the relay race was when somebody was holding something, they handed it off to somebody else. So if somebody was performing an action, that's a circuit. Then once they, come, they finish their task, like run the lap, they hand it off to somebody else in order for them to do their job. Well, the relay is the same thing. It has a coil, which means one circuit is doing its job. The coil is energized. As soon as that coil is energized, there's a little electromagnetic field inside that causes some copper tabs to click over. That now belongs to the second device. So it's this, this, this set of contacts, a set of little copper tabs that switch over. They're basically the light switch for the second half of the circuit. And sometimes in really complicated systems, it's not just one relay that drives something. It's a relay that drives another relay, that drives two other relays, that drives a timer, and, a, and, 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 all this huge sequence of devices that are driven by simple inputs. Like you got a push button and a sensor that activate a relay, and then that does some other jobs. And uh, it's, it's pretty complicated the way sometimes hundreds or even thousands of these relays all work together with each other to get a massive operation accomplished. It's not just a single device that uh, accomplishes that task. So it makes a great control and load device. There are a few of these that kind of fall inside those rules of they, they perform both tasks, control and load, depending on how they're used in the circuit, which makes them, although very useful devices, really complicated to try and wire into your circuit because you've got to think about them as two separate components because in one circuit, they're a load. But in another circuit, they're a control yet they're the same device performing those two different tasks. A little more complicated to think about and a whole lot more complicated than a push button or a light switch. Some control devices, now that we have the, the flexibility and the luxury of being able to add digital control and computer control into circuits, we have all kinds of more complicated control devices like sensors. Sensors can come in every shape and size. This is one that's a, we'll call it a proximity sensor. Uh, it really what it does is sense a distance of an object in front of it by using a little focused beam, kind of like a laser. This one isn't quite as focused as a laser, uh, but it's a long range. So the light goes out a long distance, bounces off of something and comes back. If the strength of received light is strong enough, then it activates an output. Now, actually, this one is a little tiny, almost like a relay contact inside. So instead of generating a tiny little voltage like some sensors do, some sensors aren't strong enough to run relays. That's why we have to switch to these computer control systems in order to use a lot of sensors. 
They just don't have the power sent out by them to run those big devices. This one is a set of physical contacts that switch over inside like that relay when the received strength of light is enough. And we can adjust, most of the time we can adjust how, those, uh, how the strength of the light is reflected back and what distance away the object is going to sense, uh, but sometimes they're a little more basic. Uh, a limit switch is another example of one that is a real basic form of a sensor, but a limit switch has a, a little arm that sticks out of it, and when that arm is hit by an object, a physical amount of displacement causes it to swing over and open a set of contacts. So it's a basic form of environmental sensing. You gotta have something to interface with this sensor, and once interfaced, it will open a set of contacts, or sometimes close a set of contacts. We, we have a lot of uh, different options in how we use these control devices. Uh, but if we could really kind of basically explain what are all these control devices, push button, switch, sensor, limit switch, uh, breaker, what really are we trying to accomplish when at the end of the day with these switches? Well, that can be pretty easily explained by just using a set of paper clips. So if we think about the basic form of the switch, here's two paper clips. And when I close the switch, that's the two paper clips touching. That's a closed switch and electricity can flow. Like when I turn the light switch on or push the button. As soon as I push the button, it went from being no connection to there being a connection. Now some of them swing like this. And sometimes in industrial schematics, you'll actually see that, that shown on the schematic, that action of one side being anchored and an angle that says, hey, when this thing is not being pressed, like a push button that's not being pressed or a limit switch that's not being pressed, it's open. They call that normally open. Now a push button, um, they can be either way. You can either, when you are just walking away, you're, you're just looking at the push button but not pressing it, is there no electricity flowing? Or when they're touching, is there electricity flowing? Both of those are common. Now if it's a stop button, like an emergency button, we usually kind of prefer one of those types of buttons. And we, what we could do is have it like this, normally open, and as soon as you walk over and press that button, click, now it switches and electricity flows. But in an emergency situation, I don't think I really want that. I would rather not start a new circuit when I press this stop button. Emergency, press the stop button. Wait, the stop button shouldn't be making a new path for electricity. That just doesn't sound right. It sounds more dangerous. Now also, what happens if you had a broken wire and that broken wire means that even if you press the button, there's no electricity even getting to that point to make the machine stop. So that means that I want there to always be electricity flowing in this emergency circuit, always. If I press the button, that circuit stops, no more electricity. Also, if a wire breaks somewhere, or maybe the supply that was feeding that circuit fails or comes disconnected or something like that, then electricity stops the same as if I press the button. So failure, what do we want to have happen in the case of failure? Do we want electricity to continue or do we want electricity to stop? That's the difference between having a normally open button where failure would mean no electricity flows or a normally closed, which means failure means no, again, no electricity flows, but that's the same as pressing the button. I want to know when something happened. So normally closed means electricity is always flowing until I press the button or activate the switch. But normally open means nothing is flowing until I press the button. Controls can come in either flavor, variety. Normally open, which is abbreviated NO most of the time, and NC, which is normally closed. Things that stay in either position, like this breaker, right now it's off. Right now it's on we don't really have a normal position for that because you could leave it in this position and it's on. You could leave it in this position and it's off. There isn't really a position that it stays in when you walk away. It's just whatever you last left it in, kind of like a light switch. You turn on a light switch and you can walk away. You can turn off the light switch and you can walk away. There is no position that it stays in when you let go or when it's de-energized. Most buttons that have a spring inside of them, you press them and then you release them and they pop back to their normal state. It's whether electricity is flowing in that normal state, means normally closed. Electricity not flowing when you walk away means normally open. 
Now some switches, if we stick with the paper clip here, let's use two paper clips and see what that might look like. Let's see if I can hold these. I only have two hands. Three paper clips with two hands is kind of tough, but let's see. Also not dropping them on the floor helps. So sometimes the wires will approach into the switch through two contacts. That's almost always the case. But instead of where one side of my contact connects with the other side of the contact, sometimes it's both of the contacts opening and closing. So this one is where both sides of the switch connect and disconnect from the load carrying wire. But other types of switches, only one side connects and disconnects. Both types of switches are pretty common um, and really the only way a lot of times to figure it out is to tear the switch open and find out whether it's two pieces of metal contacts opening and closing or just one piece opening and closing through kind of a swinging action. It's hard to tell. The intent of the circuit or the final outcome of the circuit really is the same either way because if you open up two sets of contacts, you're still going to you're still going to block the flow of electricity just the same as if you open up just one set of contacts you'd block the flow of electricity but when you have two sets of contacts opening and closing at the same time it's twice the amount of air gap before that spark can occur so we have a little bit more voltage resilience from that sparking and arcing if we have the double sets of contacts opening as opposed to just one set of contacts opening. But as long as we've safely used the switch according to its voltage ratings, we really shouldn't have to care whether it's one set or two sets of contacts opening. The designer has already told us what voltage level is appropriate for that switch. Now that, so that kind of sort of covers the, the very basic on off or true fault circuits. Sensors begin to kind of approach this area of control, but allowing us to get a little bit more creative because sensors, now we've got sense light that can tell us the distance to an object or light that can tell us the amount of light in the room, that's a sensor. Uh, ultrasonic, which is where they use sound pulses to send out and bounce back. It measures the amount of time delay between out and back and that can tell us a distance. It's actually the same, kind of basically the same concept as bats using their, their echolocation to find food. We can do the same thing, just use a sensor to send out this high frequency of sound. It bounces back. We can tell how far away an object is. That's great for distance sensing. We can either sense whether an object is there, which is the true false kind of thing, or we can say how far away the object is, which is a more variable range of numbers. They call that an analog sensor. Uh, temperature is another really common one because a thermostat can tell us on off temperature but we can also have uh, digital thermostats which can tell us what the temperature is not just whether this little metal spring opens or closes when you twist the knob uh, both of those are thermostats but one's a little bit smarter than the other sensors allow us to start interfacing with the environment around us but they're certainly control devices because they give the, in the circuit information about when it's okay to behave. Not just what is behaving, that's the load device, what's happening, but when to do the thing they're supposed to do. How fast to turn, how bright to put a light on, like a light dimmer. A light dimmer is a control device. It's just a little smarter than an on-off device. Now, going back to, uh, we, we talked about at the very end of the, um, the, the load devices, we talked about digital controllers which we said, well, if we can have these computer controls in a circuit, we can now have the controller as being the thing that we're sending information to, right? So when your circuit is completed, instead of turning on a light, what if it just becomes information inside of a controller? Well, that controller is also capable of being the light switch. I mentioned before that sometimes the controller is the source of energy, and that is the case sometimes. But in other cases, in fact, in most cases, the controller is not as much the source of energy as it is the light switch. If I want to choose when to turn my light switch on and off, but I don't even have to be in the room, it automatically figures out when to turn the lights on or when to turn the heater on because it has temperature sensors in all different rooms in the house. So it can automatically figure out when to turn on all the heaters in the house. That's a pretty smart system. And by the way, does not have to be connected to the internet to do that. Some people get kind of nervous when you know, you can have your home automated or a smart home and it's all connected to, to you know, Alexa or Google or whatever the latest 
uh, artificial intelligence smart connected system is, doesn't always have to connect to the internet. You can program and design your own system that uses your laptop or your computer to write your own program of when to use all this information, when to do the stuff in your house, completely disconnected from the internet. So we can still have home automation, we just don't have to have it connected to some smart source. Problem is it just takes a little bit of knowledge on how to do that, the programming and what parts and pieces to buy, the step that the, the little um, Wi-Fi modules like Alexa and Google and whatever else. The nice thing about those is they remove us having to understand the system. We just tell it, you know, hey, turn on the, turn on, let's keep the temperature in the room at this level. You figure out what to do. Um, yeah, it's, it's handy. It allows somebody else to do the thinking part of the work, but then the sacrifice for that is it's always listening. It's always interfacing. It's always paying attention to what we want. That's good, but it also has some um, weaknesses or potential, uh, potential concerns. Uh, I agree with those. I don't have anything connected in my house. Not that I disagree with the idea of automation. I love it. That's my job is automation. But I do get kind of nervous when I don't have control over it anymore and I don't know how it's working in the background. I really like to understand how things are working. So when we have these, uh, the ability to use these controllers, which sometimes don't cost more than a hundred bucks, a couple hundred bucks, free software, uh, your connection and Wi-Fi system to, to allow everything to interface is probably about the same cost as that. So if we think about these controllers as being the things that bring in our, our information about what time of day it is, what the light is, what the temperature is, all those kind of things, what day of the week, maybe different things happen on your work days as opposed to your weekends, and then the other side of this device, one side is the inputs that bring in the information. The other side is the outputs that are like the light switches. But even better than that, sometimes they can control things variably, which means instead of just turn on lights, maybe I can get it to turn on the lights gradually over the space of about five or 10 minutes, slowly begin to turn the lights on. Sometimes that has some extra benefits, much better than our basic on off control in a house or in a normal circuit. Heaters, so heaters, yeah, sometimes we can allow the, we can change how much electricity is sent to the heater to keep it on for longer at a lower voltage. We could do that, but sometimes it's fine to just allow it to turn on and off and it chooses the amount of times and when to do that. But these digital controllers, the nice thing about those is the flexibility of us being able to treat them as a load device with its own separate circuits and output devices like light switches that are all turned on and off at separate times and we get to have control over when that happens. We're probably never gonna move away from having light switches in the house. I, I wouldn't see why we'd want to. Of course I wanna be able to turn on the lights when I get home if they're not already on. But as home automation becomes more of a popular and cost effective option, we're gonna have a lot more people that are showing you ways and, and kind of inventively creating ways to be able to control that on your own instead of having to rely on one of these automatic home automation systems as cool as they are. Uh, which I will, maybe I'll, I'll have some videos on how to do that or at least to be able to create some really basic ones in your house that illustrate the idea of how easy it is to create home automation. But for now, that kind of brings us to a close on the control devices, which now wraps up all four of those basic principles of a circuit. We had to have the supply of power from the beginning which usually is a voltage source. That's why we always say you plug the, this plug into 110 volts or you use a nine volt battery. Supplying the amount of voltage, which is pressure, is really critical for driving our load devices. We also had to have the conductive path in order to get the electricity to flow through all these things from the source through the next piece, which is the load. The conductors have to get us to the load device and if we want any sort of control at all, at least an on-off switch or, or protecting us from excessive current or dangerous situations, then we have a control device in the circuit. It could be a breaker, could be a switch, or it could be as complicated as a digital controller, which is monitoring all kinds of inputs and outputs all at the same time. There's still a switch that's allowing us to turn things on and off, and that's considered a control device. Source, Conductors, load, control. In the next set of videos, now that we've covered these four basics, we'll begin to dive down into more specifics, especially on the control devices. I know a lot of people have asked about getting more into these digital controls. Uh, 
programmable logic controllers. They're a fascinating subject, but kind of complicated. Really fun though. So we'll spend a lot of time on that. We'll spend some time on sensors. We'll spend a lot of time on relays. And we'll look at some principles of household wiring, like looking at uh, some of the more complicated things, those GFCIs, those ground fault interrupters. Boy, those are just loaded with control devices because we have to have those things able to protect us in some very specific situations. We'll also spend some time looking at some load devices with a little bit more specifics uh, than just, just generally talking about lights and motors. We'll look at some specific behaviors of those and see some things that we'll have to do to the circuits. So as always, if you have any questions, comment, message, let me know. Uh, and I hope you have as much fun learning about this stuff as I do talking about it because there is a ton of cool stuff that we can do with electricity. So stay tuned. More videos coming up soon. Have a great day.